Okay. Hi everyone. Um, I feel to read these chapters of this book right now. We are almost done, you guys, with this book. Okay? Just saying. And the next book. I wasn't sure what the next book was going to be or if I was going to do a next book. But I have been guided to do that book next. So, that book is about remote viewing and the top remote viewer in the world, basically, um, celebrated, and, you know, with honors and all of that, and what he went through um, in the military industrial complex okay so here we are chapter 21 and 22 22 is kind of long 21 is like a page so chapter 21 concealing mind control abuse one strategy for concealing actual mind control is to erect pseudo scholarly fronts to disprove that such misdeeds exist. You know what I love about this guy who wrote this book, Jim Keith, is that he is very careful with his words. He's very precise with his words and the way that he tells the story is so direct and at the same time it's like in your face, right? It's super direct and in your face, but it's also like from an intellectual standpoint, right? But it's just, it's incredible. I love it. Okay. One such group is the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. A group of psychiatrists whose mission is to prove that cult abuse and mind control are figments of the imagination. Remember, this was written in 20 years ago in the year 2000 or 1999 and things have changed. We all know that it's not figments of our imagination. Look at the world we're living in today. While it is no doubt true that some cases of mind control and ritual abuse are imagined, and that false accusations do take place, there's a solid body of evidence showing that such abuse does exist. For starters, documentation on the CIA's MKUltra program is not in question. But the Foundation is intent on proving that this is not the case. Of, of the false memory Syndrome Foundation, mind control researcher Walter Boart has said, this is a central intelligence agency action. It is an action aimed at the psychological and psychiatric mental health community to discredit you, to keep you in fear and terror. The membership of the foundation is telling. Many of the psychiatrists in the group's advisory board are linked to CIA mind control operations or to the military. These persons are often called upon in court cases to discredit testimony of cult sexual abuse and mind control. One of the original members of the group, Martin T. Orn, a researcher at one time, funded through MKUltra and the gamut of military agencies, is employed at the University of Pennsylvania's Experimental Psychiatry Laboratory. Orn was friends with George Estabrooks, the early researcher on the creation of the hypnotic Manchurian candidates, and bragged to researcher John Marks that he has, was routinely briefed on advances in CIA mind control research. Some of Orne's early researches, including studies of post-hypnotic amnesia, were financed by the Human Ecology Fund. 
a conduit for CIA monies at Cornell University. What do we know about Cornell? Anybody? Anybody know what we know about Cornell? What we know about Cornell is that Dr. Anthony Fauci and Mr. Bill Gates were roommates at Cornell University. Moving on. HEF, the Human Ecology Foundation, was that what it was? Human Ecology Fund financed numerous major mind control experiments worldwide, including those of the infamous Ewan Cameron at the Montreal Allen Memorial Institute. Orrin was called in to examine Patty Hearst after the agency created Symbionese Liberation Army was immolated by the LAPD. Also evaluating Hearst was Robert J. Lifton, a founder of the CIA-contracted Human Ecology Fund, and infamous MKUltra shrink, Louis Jollyan West, Dr. Jolly, with the violence centers. Remember that? Another person testifying at the truck trial of Patty Hearst was retired Berkeley PhD Dr. Margaret Singer, also on the advisory board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Singer had studied American prisoners of the Korean War at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Maryland during the 1950s. FMSF founder, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation founder, Ralph Underwager, director of the Institute of Psychological Therapies in Minnesota, and the publisher of a magazine titled Issues in Child Abuse Allegations, is another member of the group who may have an ax to grind. It is reported that Underwager said in an interview in Amsterdam, in a journal Amsterdam Journal that it was God's will that adults have sex with children. Really? Underwager later filed an affidavit in France for members of the Children of God cult, whose tenants, at least at one time, promoted sex with children. Underwager testified that they were not guilty of child abuse. So I don't know if you know this, but Rose McGowan grew up in the Children of God cult and she escaped. Just saying. Okay, moving on. The story of Peter and Pamela Freyd, who are executive directors of the foundation, may also be significant. The Freyds have been accused of sexual abuse by their daughter, Jennifer, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. Pamela Freyd called in her own psychiatrist, Dr. Harold Leaf, an original board member of the FMSF. His determination was that Jennifer had not been abused. Leaf himself was a major in the Army Medical Corps, was on the University of Pennsylvania faculty during the time that the university was conducting federal funded experiments in behavior modification and, and assisted Dr. Orn in studies on hypnotic programming. Another strategy for discrediting victims of mind control abuse and therapists who are investigating this subject are criminal charges. In 1998, the federal government initiated criminal charges against Texas psychologist Dr. Judith, Judith Peterson, charging that she had intentionally implanted false memories into her clients in order to extend their period of therapy. Dr. Peterson was also charged with mail fraud for mailing those clients bills through the mail. 
At the time of this writing, the government had only interviewed disgruntled patients and their attorneys, neglecting to interview Dr. Peterson or clients whose experience with, the, experience with her had been positive. Earlier, the same alleged, vic, alleged victims of fraud complained to the Texas Department of Mental Health and Mental Retardation and the Texas Department of Health. After investigations by those bodies, Dr. Peterson was found to be innocent of the charges. Okay, now that, if that doesn't tell you that this whole system is rigged, I don't know what does. Because that was a page and a half of writing, and it listed five or more cases of situations where everybody protected everybody else to have their back and that they believe in sex with children. Okay, so the psychiatrists who are therapizing the victims are placing false memories in the victims and then accusing them of falsifying their memories and then keeping them innocent and out of jail for their actions of sex with children and mind control. Okay, got that? Okay. Moving on, chapter 22, electronic mind control. Now, I'm not gonna comment on that chapter with my own personal experience because I'll just say this one sentence. My entire life, I was accused of being the boy who cried wolf or the girl who cried wolf. And I was accused of lying and being a pathological liar my whole life. It wasn't until I was in my 40s as an adult with my father and I having no communication for years that I was able to dismantle some of that in order to believe myself and my memories that were clear as a bell and detailed and coincided with my life in such a way that I could not deny them. I did this on my own because prior to that, when I was 16 and was in therapy, They told me I was mentally unstable. They wanted to put me on drugs. My mom, fortunately for me, protected me from that. But later on, my dad managed to get me on drugs for two months, right? He would have had me locked up in a mental hospital to keep that secret. But fortunately for me, I'm too smart for that. And I figured it out and I got myself out of it, right? Okay, moving on. Moving on. Electronic Mind Control, Chapter 22. A giant leap forward in the technical capability for mind control came with the discovery that electromagnetic energy could be used to influence, disable, or kill humans at a distance. Okay, EMFs, right? What are we dealing with right now? Five to the G, to the whatever. Okay, the famous scientist Nikola Tesla, Nikola Tesla was one of the first persons to delve into the effects of electromagnetics on the human organism. With E.L. Chafee and R.U. Light following in 1934. R.U. Light, isn't that cute? That's cute. With the monograph, A Method for the Remote Control of Electrical Stimulation of the Nervous System. In the same year, Soviet scientist Leonid L. Vasilev, Vasilev wrote Critical Evaluation of the Hypogenic Method about the discoveries of Dr. I. F. Tomaszewski and his research into remote influencing of the brain through radio waves. Vasilev 
wrote, As a control of the subject's condition when she was outside the laboratory in another set of experiments, a radio setup was used. Not many experiments of this sort were carried out but the results obtained indicate that the method of using radio signals substantially enhances the experimental possibilities. Later in the paper, Vasilev wrote, Tomi Tomaszewski carried out the first experiment with this subject at a distance of one or two rooms and under conditions where the participant would not know or suspect that she would be experimented with. In other cases, the sender was not in the same house and someone else observed the subject's behavior. Subsequent experiments at considerable distances were successful. One such experiment was carried out in a part at a distance. Mental suggestion to go to sleep was complied with within a minute. Another researcher into the potential of electromagnetics in the 1930s was Professor E. Kazamali. Kazamali bombarded subjects with VHF radio waves and told an astounded world that his subjects would hallucinate when under the influence of his oscillatory telegraphica. Andrija Puharik was another early researcher into the effects of electromagnetics who delved into the effects of radio waves on animals, working at Northwestern University in the late 1940s. Puharik founded a laboratory he called the Round Table Foundation of Electrobiology in what he modestly termed a barn in the woods outside of Camden, Maine in 1948. It was hardly a barn sized 100 by 50 feet, with a basement and upper story. It had been used by the Navy, reportedly for storage during World War II. Among Puharik's associates at the round table were Warren S. McCullough, one of the founders of cybernetics theory, who had worked at Bellevue Hospital in New York. McCullough was an early advocate of electronic brain implants and chaired conferences sponsored by Josiah Macy, the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, hold on, <coughs> a channel for CIA mind control funding. Another associate of Puharik's was John Hayes Hammond, said to have been Nikola Tesla's only student. Hayes was also interested in the use of electromagnetics to influence the human mind. <clears throat> After the demise of Puharik's roundtable, he spent time with social engineer Alex Huxley, Aldous Huxley, in Tecate, Mexico, after studying the effects of electronics on the human organism. <clears throat> Puharik was also employed at the Army's Chemical and Biological Warfare Center at Fort Detrick, Maryland, researching the effects of LSD for the CIA in 1954. <clears throat> he delved into the effects of digitoid drugs at the per Permanente Research Foundation with funding from the Sandoz Chemical Works. Among Puharik's accomplishments was the design of what is in, described as a radio tooth implant, the technical specs of which were sold to the CIA. At a conference on electromagnetism in September of 1987, Puharik described this invention. We were able to develop a hearing device that fit under the cap of a tooth and we could hear very clearly from a small little relay and receiver and transmitter and unfortunately it was promptly classified by an agency of our government. But we did solve the problem in terms of hardware. The radio tooth implant may still be in use. According to the Chemical and Engineering News for February 5th, 1996 in a story titled Hong Kong professor sues U.S. for mind control. 
Let me read that again. Hong Kong professor sues U.S. for mind control. The South China Morning Post reported on January 25th that an assistant professor at the University of Science and Technology, Hong Kong, has filed a hundred million dollar suit against the U.S. government for implanting mind control devices in his teeth. Hong Huang Siming charges that the devices were implanted during root canal work in 1991 while he was studying at the University of Iowa, according to Morning Post reported Patricia Young. Another student at Iowa University who, like Huang, was born in China, had gone on a shooting spree, and the feds, Huang says, put the devices in his teeth to find out if he was involved. The Hong Kong professor says he suffered an Alzheimer's disease-like memory loss that hampered his teaching. It stopped, he says, only when he sought legal aid to mount his lawsuit. Besides the U.S., the suit names the University of Science and Technology on the grounds that it was involved in continuing the mind control work. It also seeks punitive damages of $1 million from the defendants for low ethical standards. Huang claims that one of the devices in his teeth can read his thoughts and talk to his mind when he's asleep. A second device he believes transmits pictures of what he sees to a receiver for recording. The mind controller, he says, can drive him to bad behavior. He gives two examples, one of which cannot be mentioned in a family magazine. Huang is not alone in his complaints about having mind control devices implanted in his teeth. David B. recounts his story. X-rays revealed a metal object on the left side of my skull under the jaw in the soft tissue of my neck. In May 1996, I finally had it removed. I asked many doctors about the possibility of it falling there during an extraction. They said possible but remote. Most of them thought it punctured my neck from the outside. I sent x-rays to Dr. Sims and he arranged removal. The strange thing that came out of this was the discovery of the small object in my shoulder. Dr. Lear, Dr. John Lear, who's now dead, called after receiving my x-rays and asked if I had ever broken my shoulder. If I had ever been in an explosion, I replied no. He said the reason was that the x-ray clearly showed a screw in my left shoulder. He said it looked like an operation from a broken shoulder. I have never broken a bone to my knowledge call, and called my mother to ask. She said I'd had no operations as a child. This part is a complete mystery. During the first six months of torture, extreme at that time, I went to a dentist and reported pain under my new dental bridge, installed a few months before the assault. He removed it and I was still in contact. So I wrote off my teeth and concentrated on my throat wrongly. In my x-rays and CAT scan, one tooth is very bright and in one frame of the CAT scan, it shows rays of white emanating from it. People I asked said it was probably an interference effect with the metal. An insight into the state of early Soviet research into electromagnetics is provided by an account of a meeting held on May 22, 1963 in the office of Professor Zinoviev at the Ministry of Higher and Secondary Specialized Education in the Soviet Union in a meeting of 16 scientists. A professor, Armitov, or Artemov, sorry, mentioned what we, he called a mental work machine. Artemov said 
that in the near future, an electromagnetic broadcasting unit the size of a transistor radio would be used to stimulate creativity and mental energy. Artemov said that the first models of the machine that had been constructed were desktop size, but now the units were portable and were in use. That was in 1963. The Soviets also worked on less benign applications of electromagnetics. About 1960, as microwave scientist Milton Zaret recalls it, he was approached by the CIA. Zaret had worked on Air Force project evaluating potential eye damage to radar and microwave technicians. But the CIA was interested in more arcane matters. They asked about the effect of microwaves on human behavior and the possibility of using microwaves for brainwashing. Later in 1965, they finally disclosed to Zaret why they were interested. The U.S. Embassy in Moscow was being bombarded with microwaves by the Soviets with radiation that they dubbed the Moscow signal. Zaret was briefed on Project Pandora, a government program in progress that was aimed at finding out why the Soviets were irradiating the embassy and perhaps turning that research to the CIA's own purposes. In one Project Pandora experiment, chimpanzees were irradiated with microwave bursts. The head of the program determined that the potential for exerting a degree of control on human behavior by low-level microwave radiation seems to exist, and he urged that the effects of microwaves be studied for possible weapons applications. Zaret conducted his own tests and determined that whatever other reasons the Russians may have had, they believed the beam would modify the behavior of this personnel. Zaret's recommendations were simple. The American government should demand that the Soviets stop irradiating its employees. Persians stationed at the embassy should also be briefed on what was going on, which they had not been, and be given the option of transferring to other areas of the world. Zaret was assured that his suggestions would be followed, but they were in only one particular. President Lyndon B. Johnson issued a demand to the Soviets that the irradiation end. They ignored him. Embassy personnel were never told that they were being subjected to electromagnetic irradiation, nor that tests showed many of them were afflicted with terrible medical problems. Ambassador Walter J. Stossel had problems with bleeding from the eyes and was diagnosed with a blood disease similar to leukemia. The two previous ambassadors had both died of cancer. State Department tests also found what they described as a slightly higher white blood cell count in one third of the employees tested but in fact their lymphocyte count was 40% higher than normal. Several children of embassy employees were found to have blood disorders. They would only learn of the source of their illnesses in 1972 when newspaper columnist Jack Anderson would blow the whistle on the Moscow signal in the newspaper column. A possible byproduct of Project Pandora is that in 1961, Dr. Alan Frey reported that microwaves are sometimes audible to humans, although the discovery was dismissed by many scientists as being a case of outside noise. Frey's experiment was later described in detail by James C. Lynn in his Microwave Auditory Effects and Applications. All right, I can tell you right now that where I'm living, we are being microwaved. I can hear an audible high-frequency tone 
right now, when I take my headphones off, when I'm going to sleep at night, it's happening. We're being fried. I live in the city in an apartment building. Not my first choice, but it's where I am right now, assigned. So, a possible byproduct of Project Pandora is that in 1961, Dr. Alan Frey reported that microwaves are sometimes audible to humans. Although the discovery was dismissed by many scientists as being a case of outside noise. Frey's experiment was later described in detail by James C. Lynn in his Microwave Auditory Effects and Applications. Frey found that human subjects exposed to 1310 mHz and 2982 mHz microwaves at average power densities of 0.4 to 2 milliwatts per square centimeter perceived auditory sensations described as buzzing or knocking sounds. The peak power densities were on the order of two to three hundred microwaves per square centimeter and the pulse repetition frequencies varied from 200 to 400 Hertz. So imagine 60 gigahertz. Just saying. Frey referred this to this auditory phenomenon as the RF radio frequency sound. The sensation occurred instantaneously at average incident power densities well below the, that necessary for known biological damage and appeared to originate from within or near the back of the head. There were important ramifications to Frey's discovery. In his paper, Human Auditory System Response to Modulated Electromagnetic Energy, Frey explained how voices can be beamed directly into an individual's head. Among other areas of research, Frey also delved into the induction of heart seizures by beamed electromagnetics. Other Pandora personnel included Operation Paperclip Nazis like Dr. Dietrich Bacher, who irradiated 7,000 Navy crewmen with dangerous levels of radiation at the Naval Aerospace Research Laboratory in Pensacola, Florida, Bashir simply disappeared in 1977 with records of his employment and his existence expunged. Spanish researchers maintain that brain implant specialist Dr. Jose Delgado was also involved in Pandora. In 1972, the Department of the Army released a report titled Controlled Offensive Behavior USSR, documenting 500 Russian studies of the use of super high frequency electromagnetic oscillations. SHF may be used as a technique for altering human behavior, the report stated. Legal and non lethal effects, lethal and non lethal effects have been shown to exist. In certain non-lethal exposures, definite behavioral changes have occurred. In the same year, the U.S. Army Mobility Equipment Research and Development Center released a study titled Analysis of Microwaves for Barrier Warfare. The report discussed the use of truck portable microwave broadcasting systems that would be used to irradiate and immobilize people and suggested that with the current state of armament, there was no way of protecting against the use of such a system. At about the same, electronics engineer Tom Jasky was conducting experimentation using a low power oscillator broadcasting at three to 600 megahertz 
to irradiate subjects. In repeated trials, subjects were able to detect the electromagnetic sweeps, and at these individual frequencies, the same subjects announced having experienced pulsing sensations in the brain, ringing in the ears, and an odd desire to bite the experimenters. As research in mind control progressed, the potential of directly and precisely influencing the human brain with microwaves became apparent. Technologies whereby emotions, messages, and subliminal commands could be beamed directly to the brain of unwitting subjects were researched by both the American and the Soviet governments. Among many other projects, the Department of Defense funded work of J.F. Schapitz, who in 1974 proposed the use of radio broadcasting in conjunction with hypnotic control. In this investigation, Schapitz wrote, it will be shown that the spoken word of the hypnotist may be conveyed by modulate electromagnetic energy directly into the subconscious parts of the human brain, i.e without employing any technical devices for receiving or transcoding the messages and without the person exposed to such influence having a chance to control the information input consciously. The second experiment was to be the implanting of hypnotic suggestions for simple acts, like leaving the lab to buy some particular item which were to be triggered by a suggested time, spoken word, or sight. Subjects were to be interviewed later. It may be expected that they rationalize their behavior and consider it to be undertaken out of their own free will. The results of Shabbat's experimentation have never been released to the public. In 1978, Dr. Andrew Mitrowski wrote that potentially almost anything could be inserted into the target brain mind systems. And such insertions would be processed by the biosystems as internally generated data slash effects. Words, phrases, images, sensations, and emotions could be directly inserted and experienced in the biological targets as internal states, codes, emotions, thoughts, and ideas. On April 20th, 1976, an apparatus and method for remotely monitoring and altering brain waves was patented. Oh, how lovely. Its inventor was Robert G. Malek of New York. According to the patent abstract, it is an apparatus for and method of sensing brainwaves at a position remote from a subject whereby electromagnetic signals of different frequencies are simultaneously transmitted to the brain of the subject. Although somewhat technical in its jargon, the summary of the invention in the patent bears waiting through for the interested researcher. Quote, the present invention relates to apparatus and a method for monitoring brain waves wherein all components of the apparatus employed are remote from the test subject. More specifically, high frequency transmitters are operated to radiate electromagnetic energy of different frequencies through antennas, which are capable of scanning the entire brain of the test subject or any desired region thereof. This is in the 70s, folks. Just saying. The signals of different frequencies penetrate the skull of the subject and impinge upon the brain where they mix to yield an interference wave modulated by radiation from the brain's natural electrical activity. 
The modulated interference wave is retransmitted by the brain and received by an antenna at a remote station where it is demodulated and processed to provide a profile of the subject's brain waves. In addition to passively monitoring his brain waves, the subject's neurological processes may be affected by transmitting to his brain through a transmitter compensating signals. The latter signals can be derived from the received and processed brain waves. In the years 1980 to 1983, the Marine Corps sponsored research into electromagnetic weaponry with the project run by Eldon Byrd, a specialist in medical bioengineering. The lion's share of the research was conducted at the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. With research done on small animals and even Bird himself, Bird's focus was an attempt to see if electromagnetic waves could be used to influence it or entrain the brain activity of living organisms. Using electromagnetic broadcasting, Bird says, we could put animals into a stupor by hitting them with these frequencies. We got chick brains in vitro to dump 80% of the natural opioids in their brains. The effects were non-lethal and reversible. You could disable a person temporarily, Bird suggests, that it would have been like a stun gun. Bird's program was scheduled for four years, but was closed down after two. Bird believes that it wasn't because the research was unsuccessful. Their work was really outstanding. We would have had a weapon in one year. Bird's program, oh wait, sorry. Bird believes that the work was not discontinued, but was instead simply taken out of his hands and turned into a black project. That statement is hardly outlandish, and numerous other researchers in electromagnetics tell a similar tale of having their work taken away from them at the precise point when they began to get successful results. As conservative a publication as the International Review of the Red Cross in 1990 acknowledged the ascendancy, ascendancy of beam weapons in the field of warfare. The authors of an article titled The Development of New Anti-Personnel Weapons stated, quote, the effects induced in human beings by electromagnetic waves have been known, albeit imperfectly, for a long time and have been the subject of continuous research. Depending on the frequency used, the emission mode, the energy radiated, and the shape and duration of the pulses used, electromagnetic radiation directed against the human body may produce heat and cause serious burns or even changes in the molecular structure of the tissues they reach. Research work in this field has been carried out in almost all industrialized countries, and especially by the great powers, with a view to using these phenomena for anti-material or anti-personnel purposes. Tests have demonstrated that powerful microwave pulses could be used as a weapon in order to put the adversary hors de combat or even kill them. It is possible today to generate a very powerful microwave pulse between 150 and 3000 megahertz with an energy level of several hundreds of megawatts. Now this is in 1999, you guys. Using specially adapted antenna systems, these generators could in principle transmit over hundreds of meters sufficient energy to cook a meal. However, it is important to mention that the lethal or incapacitating effects, which can be expected from weapon systems using this technology, can be produced with a much lower energy level. Using the principle of a magnetic field concentration, which permits, permits the control of the geometry on the target, 
by means of antenna systems especially designed for the purpose, the radiated energy can be concentrated on very small surfaces of the human body. For example, the base of the brain where relatively low energy can produce lethal effects. In 1991, the ITV News Bureau reported on the first known use of electronic subliminals on the battlefield and the true reason for the seemingly illogical and apparently suicidal attack by Iraqi troops on the deserted city of Al Kafji, 12 miles south of the Kuwaiti border. According to ITV, the Iraqis had launched a successful attack meant to destroy an FM radio station that had been installed in Al Kafji by the U.S. Defense Department's PSYOPs branch. Although the station outwardly appeared to be broadcasting Tokyo Rose style propaganda, deserting Iraqi soldiers claimed that the real purpose of the station was to broadcast the new high tech type of subliminal messages referred to as ultra high frequency silent sounds or silent subliminals. According to ITV, although completely silent to the human ear, the negative voice messages placed on the tapes alongside the audible programming by PSYOPs psychologists were clearly perceived by the subconscious minds of the Iraqi soldiers, and the silent messages completely demoralized them and instilled a perpetual feeling of fear and hopelessness in their minds. In 1993, a method of inducing mental, emotional, and physical states of consciousness, including specific mental activity in human beings, was patented by its inventor, Robert A. Monroe. The now deceased Monroe was an early practitioner of what is termed remote viewing or out of body travel and is the founder of the Monroe Institute in Charlottesville, Virginia. He is reported to have had close connections to the CIA. The abstract of Monroe's patent says, that specific states of consciousness can be induced through generation of stereo audio signals having specific wave shapes and that in accordance with the invention, human brain waves in the form of EEGs are superimposed upon specific stereo audio signals known as carrier frequencies which are within the range of human hearing. Monroe followed up his initial invention with a method of an apparatus for inducing desired states of consciousness, apparently a new and improved form of his first offering. The U.S. Air Force Review of Biotechnology in 1982 warned that, quote, radio frequency radiation, RFR, fields may pose powerful and revolutionary anti-personnel military threats. RFR experiments and the increasing understanding of the brain as an electrically mediated organ suggests the serious probability that impressed electromagnetic fields can be disruptive to purposeful can be disruptive to purposeful behavior and make be capable of directing and or interrogating such behavior. Further, the passage of approximately 100 milliamperes through the mitocardium of the brain can lead to cardiac standstill and death. Again, pointing to speed of light weapons effect. A rapidly scanning RFR system could provide an effective stun or kill capability over a large area.
One second. The article continued. There is little doubt that crowd control devices using radio frequency radiation do exist. The development of such devices would complement sonic and infrared weapons, which are well known and were advertised in the British Defense Equipment Catalog until 1983. These included the Valkyrie, an infrared device causing night blindness, blindness, and the Squawk Box or Sound Curdler developed by the U.S. for use in Vietnam. The Squawk Box was designed to induce feelings of giddiness and nausea in the victim and is highly directional so that as individuals are hit by this invisible effect, the distress and confusion is spread amongst a crowd. In 1984, the Ministry of Defense ordered that all advertisements and references to frequency weapons be cut from the defense catalog. By 1993, the National Institute of Justice, an office of the Justice Department, was recommending in its NIJ initiative on less than lethal weapons that state and local police departments in America utilize psychotronic, electromagnetic, and other mind control weapons against American citizens involved in domestic disturbances. A description so broad as to include family arguments. The report said, short-term research will be completed to adopt military technologies to use by domestic law enforcement, including laser, microwave, and electromagnetic weapons. The Washington Post reported, the Pentagon and the Justice Department have agreed to share state-of-the-art military technology with civilian law enforcement agencies, including exotic, non-lethal weapons. This new approach to law enforcement was showcased in a three-day secret conference on non-lethal weaponry at the Applied Physics Laboratory at John Hopkins University in Maryland. Huh. Event 201. The conference head was Colonel John B. Alexander, Program Manager for Non-Lethal Psychotronic Defense, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Attending the meeting was Attorney General Janet Reno, Military Weapons Specialists, and representatives from state and local police departments. A wide variety of subjects were covered at the conference, including radio frequency weapons, high-powered microwave technology, acoustic technology, voice synthesis, and application of extreme frequency electromagnetic fields to non-lethal weapons. The U.S. Air Force has installed high-power microwave generators on air-launched cruise missiles. The stated purpose for the beam generators is to wage computer warfare, frying delicate computer components, but these generators would also theoretically be able to fry the delicate mental components of human beings. Has electromagnetic weaponry ever moved beyond the experimental stage and been used on citizens? Yes, it has. Now, has it ever been utilized in experiments upon an unsuspecting population the way that drugs and other forms of behavior modification were used in MKUltra? Literally thousands of persons worldwide believe that they have. They claim that electronic assault weapons have been used on them, either for experimentation or possibly for harassment. The sheer number of these accounts, 
the parallels to what has been verified in terms of government testing, and the credibility of many of the persons making these claims strongly suggest covert use of these weapons on civilians. One man who believes that he has been irradiated with electronic beam weapons is Martin C. Mack. In an open letter, Mr. Mack describes his experience. Quote, I am a former truck driver, now retired. My troubles with what I am about to recount began in the fall of 1987 when I rented a room in Seattle, Washington. The renter next to me had visitors who tried to avoid being seen by me. Comments were made about me describing my actions as if coming from his room. Somehow they were able to make me hear and also pick up on the process of my hearing, hear what I heard. As if my head, strange as that sounds, was a sort of antenna. And I picked things up, not subliminally, but audibly. They knew when I was coming and going and commented on such. While I was at the hotel, talk was heard about what I was doing. They could account for much of what I did in my room and in that building. They must have some way of watching me, I thought. Statements to throw me off as to what they were doing were heard, such as, This stinger will reach 35 feet, and there is a two-way mirror in the lobby, let us test him, was heard. This was before I moved out, and afterward, he has a microphone in his throat. I do not have a material one there, of course. It was implied that they could pick up on what I voiced. All this seemed like an impossibility. Due to what has transpired over the years, I know these things as fact, regardless of what others might think. One night, my spine was made very warm. That region is thermal sensitive and part of, a central, part of the central nervous system. The reflex arc which passes through the spine was triggered and gave my body a jerk. They could heat sting my back shoulder blades. The bone coverings of those are pain sensitive. They decided to drive me out of there and did before the month was up. There is a way that a person can be made selectively receptive to a modulated radio frequency carrier, and that was resolved while I was there. Before leaving, I inquired as to how long the two previous tenants stayed in that room. A month or two, the manager said. I was not hurt so very badly after they drove me out. Concerning the behavior and mind control, there is not much of a point in stimulating a person unless you can get a visual or audible response from the subject. They do get an audible one from me, a curse for one thing. How I think it is done. An unmodulated radio frequency carrier is sent out from one location, preferably lower in frequency. It passes into the spine and head regions of the subject. The carrier is modulated by the electromagnetic nature of the hearing process. Speech and inner speech of the victim. The fields of the processes piggyback onto the carrier. It thought that the unwanted fields are filtered out on the arrival at the point of reception. If what is received by the offenders displeased them, then a hurtful stimuli is sent out on a carrier to cause pain to the subject. Hence behavior and mind control. There is much more to it than that. All sorts of responses can be brought about in the body and head by modulation of a radio frequency carrier with various frequencies of sound and energy, hearing and cranial pain, ear pain, and others. Yes, heart pain, torture, and death. They are able to resolve motion or the absence thereof. 
A very loud snap sound can be caused at the rear of the head. The sound modulation can be spiked and cause hurtful jolts of pain. Eye stinging and eye pains have been caused. The heat pain sting torture is believed to be caused by vibrating the molecules and nerve endings of the thermal receptors. While in the process of thinking about what they are doing or reading, some people use inner speech and subvocalization. The trachea, i.e. windpipe, is piezoelectric and should act as a transducer. Subvocalization has been recorded directly off the throat by researchers. The indications have long been good that they can take off the electric magnetic field associated with the inner speech. They have commented on that of which I inwardly voiced many times. In other words, you can be thinking something and think about it in a voice way but not express it and they can pick it up. The shoulder muscles can be made stiff and sore, those of the neck also. The heart muscle can be made sore. sore. I am monitored round the clock. Seep deprivation is caused each night. The offenders needed a scapegoat to field test their equipment on, and with me they got lots of practice. Regina Cullen, a resident of the UK, also reports that she has been the victim of electronic assault. How many more pages do we have? A couple more pages. She feels that she was targeted for such harassment because of a complaint that she made against local police in 1984. After numerous examples of more overt forms of harassment, including having her bicycle tires slashed, her car broken into, and being physically assaulted twice, she says, a new element of harassment appeared. My home was rendered uninhabitable by frequency assault. What I now know to be microwaves and or infrared infrasound was, were used to turn the room into a torture chamber. Cullen reports that she was harassed with an irregularly pulsed humming sound, impossible to tell which direction it came from, seemingly louder than one was lying down, when one was lying down. It reverberated most in the area just behind the ear, the mastoid bone area, which is filled with air pockets, and caused my eyes to ache and my forehead to feel fuzzy and interfered with. The woman was forced to change residences repeatedly during the ensuing years. She says, sometime in outrage at being forced out of my home, I'd return in the middle of the night to find complete peace and quiet, but 10 or 20 minutes later the frequency assault would begin again. At one location, she says, I believe the source of the assault was the flat above unless microtechnology is hidden in one's own flat, for this took place on the 11th floor. There were no houses of comparable height nearby, and the flat above was inhabited by the building's caretaker. On the day this happened, there had been a man pretending to be asleep in a red car parked half onto the sidewalk in front of the building's entrance. I was instantly afraid of him, but warned myself not to be paranoid. Two weeks later, as I was running suddenly for a bus and looking over my soldier, I, got, I caught him ducking behind a van to avoid being seen following me. Cullen says that earlier back at the bed sit, a single occupancy room, Intuition had given me another clue to look out of my spy hole just at the hooligan, just as the hooligan was being handed a strange box with orange hemispherical plastic knobs on each corner by a trench coated detective type who did not speak and took care not to creak the hallway doors. Not long after that, I saw him carrying in full view a small Christmas tree-shaped aerial, and he seemed upset that I had seen it. On one occasion, as Cullen sat in her garden, 
Something shot through my head with a strange pssst sound as it happened, seeming to come from behind the fence. I was terrified and could no longer sleep there anymore. A year or so later, sitting in front of the window with the curtains open, the same thing happened again, and the TV instantly turned to snow. The alignment that that time of the invisible beam was such that it came from above and on the other side of the garden, from the very area where in 1986 had appeared a momentary pencil-like beam of white light which was aimed at my bathroom window. Cullen describes two types of electronic assault. Symptoms of type 1 include a bizarre feeling that the right and left halves of the brain are separating with a cap in between, as if parts of the head and face are rearranged spatially, as in a cubist painting. There is an impression of slight puffiness in the face, a flattening of the nose, and a definement of features. Type 2 symptoms include the feeling that I could hardly breathe and felt like I was in an oven. Each breath is like trying to inhale searing desert air, along with the usual headache and severe lassitude, sore tired eyes, fatigue, hot burning skin, old scars throbbing, and an overwhelming sense of oppression, evil, and helplessness. Further substantiating these claims of electronic assault are the reports of believed victims of mind control harassment who have observed suspect equipment in areas adjacent to where they live. A number of reports of this kind have been compiled by the Association of National Security Alumni in their electronic surveillance project intending to document and expose mind control abuses in the United States. One individual documented by the Electronic Surveillance Project talked to her next door neighbor who claimed that he was a military intelligence officer employed by a space technology firm and that he was on a year long temporary duty in the individual's apartment building. It was later determined that the individual was not employed in the military when the pretended military intelligence officer moved out of the apartment building. The contact went into his department, into his apartment and found a microwave oven sized device and that an excavation had been made in the wall facing her apartment. Another believed victim of mind control harassment looked through the window of her neighbor's apartment to see a one by five foot gray box. A black framed lens projected from the box facing in the direction of her apartment. According to the witness, the box was being operated in some fashion by a man in a three piece suit who was startled when he realized that he was being observed. Oh, that's it. Synthetic telepathy. Yeah. So, my experience with this, if you want to hear, do you want to hear? I hope you want to hear. So, oh my God, there's so many stories I could tell you. But I will stick to the, well, what's currently going on with me is like freaking kindergarten compared to what I used to deal with before I left the United States. And then upon returning, it has returned. But so, all right. So in the United States, before I left the United States, I have many instances of being electronically beamed. Um, I have numerous places that I lived where I felt like I was being observed all the time. In fact, pretty much every single place that I lived, I've, I always knew I was being monitored from the time I was a kid. Like I always knew somebody was watching me. 
Um, and at a certain point, I just got used to it, which is really effing sad that like I just got used to it. Um, and it wasn't until I started doing things like in 2012, where I was like affecting human consciousness on a deeper level that I started, I mean, I was being targeted up until I'm still being targeted, but it wasn't until I started to come into my power and take my power and like start to do specific things. And I had to really fight and really push to make things happen. And I mean, really push to make things happen. I still do. It is very difficult to be seen. Um, it's like they're protecting everyone from me, from being seen, from me being witnessed. Um, because I have an influence, because I'm able to shift consciousness. Um, and this is something that I'm in my power with now. So it's, it's very difficult to stop me from um, affecting consciousness in a positive way. Uh, so, but up until 2015, I was scared because I was being threatened and I was being run off the road by cars. Um, I had crazy shit happening to me all the time, all the time, like every day, all the time for years. And what's beautiful about it though, is it helped me develop a system of energy uh, management that has now helped others and um, has, there's like specific protocols in place now for that type of um, targeting, right? And when I left the US, it wasn't until I got to a certain place in England, which they tried to keep me out of England, okay? They tried to keep me out of England, um, but they didn't manage to do that. And I ended up being there off and on for 16 months. I ended up living there. And I'm really glad that I did um, because I learned so much about history. Oh, excuse me. And how um, how the magical history of the world has been hidden. And I had a lot of targeting as well during that time, but not the same type of targeting. It wasn't a military type of targeting. It was more, it wasn't like an electronic harassment. It was more like people. Right. So they would. So right now, as it stands, they their way of targeting me is very different now because they can't really get in um, energetically. So they have to go about it in different ways um, and bring people into my life or whatever. So it's a little bit more difficult now for them to be able to target me. Uh, it's not impossible, but they do a really good. They have to really maneuver and finagle to figure it out, you know. Um, and so one of the things that is really important to understand is that the electronic harassment is on the entire population now. So even if it's specific to you, chances are your next door neighbor is also experiencing it and they're doing a blanket targeting of, of like the population right now, clearly. And they're keeping people from rising up or freaking out or whatever. And then they're targeting other people and making them freak out. So this is all just like a ploy. This is just like a big psyop there. It's a mind fuck for them. They're just having a great time with it. They're just playing. Right. And at the same time, they're panicking and they're pulling out all the stops and they're using all the things that they have to try to keep the public from completely going off on them because they know that their time is up. Um, and so for me, like, because I've been through this for so many years, my entire life, essentially 51 years of my life, I've been like monitored, messed with, targeted, fugitive from 
the US, you know, like literally expat, you know. Um, I have somehow managed to stay out of law's way, which is a miracle. I have somehow managed to keep myself from too much trouble, you know, considering what I've been through and how I'm targeted. It's kind of amazing that, you know, I'm not further fucked with than I already am, right? <laughs> so, I don't know. I feel like I'm not talking to anybody right now so because I can't see if anybody's actually listening. It doesn't say anyone's there. I'm sure there are people there, but... <laughs> Linda, you're welcome. She said, thank you for choosing to read this particular book. You're welcome. And the next book I'm reading, I want to tell you guys specifically, is this one. And in that last chapter, they actually mentioned, um, they actually mentioned something that I read in this book, which I wasn't expecting, which is, uh, the you know, using your mind to like blanket and cause, you know, uh, death, right? Or whatever that is. So the first, very first chapter in this book, he talks about like remote viewing and psychic killing and all of that. And it's just, it's really, whoa, you know, but it's real. So one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I feel very compelled to bring forward this information because it is presented in a way that's well-researched and it's not like, That's super interesting. Oh, did he die? Oh, dude, I think he died. I think this guy's dead, actually. Because here's the thing that shows him, right? Um, it says, Jim Keith, 1949 to 1999. I should check and see if this guy's still alive. He has some freaking amazing, there's some amazing books in here about conspiracy. Conspiracy. Can we just like, can we retire that term now? Because we all know, we all know that conspiracies end up being true. And there's no such thing as conspiracy. It was, it was actually populated by the the mainstream media in relation to you know the the uh questioning of jfk's assassination right that's how the conspiracy theory um conspiracy started <laughs> the conspiracy theory conspiracy that is so good I'm going to do something with that. I'm going to, I'm going to make that into a meme. I got to make that into a meme, you guys. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I should just put the conspiracy theory conspiracy began in regards to the questioning of JFK's assassination in 1962. Right. Was it 62 or 63? I think it was actually 63. Sorry. Anyway, thank you for listening. I'm gone an hour and 20 minutes, so I'm like, I should probably stop. I could be on here forever, you know. I could just be hanging out with nobody. Yes, everybody. I don't even know who's listening. I love you so much. Thank you for being with me through this process of this story time with Sarah Lee. I feel like it's just a good way to, like, get information that people wouldn't normally read this book, you know, and I wouldn't normally read this book. So it's, a, it's an opportunity for me to read a book and get valuable information from a book that I feel really strongly connected to. Um, so yeah, thank you for being here. I appreciate you and I will see you next time. Tuttle, tuttle, tuttle.